paranormal, UFOs, monsters, mysteries. You're listening to Talking Weird. And now, from a cabin deep in the Northwoods, your hosts, Dr. Dean Bertram and Jen Durrell. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Talking Weird on the Untold Radio Network. I'm your host, Dean Bertram, and I'm flying this bird solo tonight, although I have an amazing guest. For those of you who don't watch any other shows on the network yet, you should. It's There's several fantastic shows, so go on over to untoldradioam.com and check them out, or just have a look at the Facebook or YouTube pages, and you'll see all the other shows i do i actually host one other show on a tuesday night it's called mysterious library where myself and my co-host jason mclean talk about all kinds of weird and wonderful books that we're into and speaking of weird and wonderful books i thought this might be fun tonight since i don't have a co-host to to chatter with this is what i'm currently reading i'm just about to finish it it's war over lemuria by richard toronto it's about the shaver mystery and richard shaver and ray palmer and for those of you who aren't aware of the mystery you should read that book perhaps modern ufology wouldn't have been what it is if it hadn't been for shaver and palmer it's just an absolutely fascinating book and what you're reading why don't you put in the comments tonight i'd love to know what everybody out there is reading at the moment particularly if it's 40 and all weird but whatever it is it would be great to see what you guys are consuming anyway let's get on with the show because i'm so excited about tonight's guest he's a writer a filmmaker and the host creator of the penny royal podcast which is just podcast gold it's so great if you haven't listened to it you should he's a native of kentucky and he's been researching the folklore mystery history and high strangeness of the bluegrass state for over two decades. In addition to the Penny Royal podcast, he films and produces the music series Summer Sessions. So I'm delighted to welcome to the show, Nathan Paul Isaac. Hey, Dean, how's it going? <laughs> Greetings, Nathan. It's so great to have you here. Oh, man, I'm so excited to chat with you tonight. So. And I've wanted to chat to you since Penny Royal first came out, although that's not where I first saw you, to be honest. I first saw you in, I think it's season one of Hellia, like episode mm -hmm. eight. I think that's where I first became uh, Yeah, season two. Yeah, season two. Season two, okay. Yeah, they, they come down to uh, Somerset, yeah. Yeah, that's right, because they're in Hellier in the first season yeah, and then yep, Somerset yep, in the second. Yep. That makes sense. And what was fascinating is you guys were kind of doing parallel research, like this idea of the secret Commonwealth and the great God Pan was popping up in both of the things that you were doing. Maybe we that maybe that's where we could start. Could you could you tell us a little bit about the synchronicities between what the New Kirks were doing with Hellier and what you were up to in Somerset? Yeah, that's uh, I think that was probably the weirdest thing for me about the whole you know interaction with hillier and and uh uh with greg and and dana and the whole crew coming down here but um i've been working with a pretty famous artist named uh dan dutton he's a kentucky artist um sculptor painter you know uh, also he uh writes and directs uh dance operas and so that that's really what he's most famous for um and in the 1990s uh, he produced a series of uh, dance operas called The Secret Commonwealth. And I think it's uh, four of them over a 12 year period. They were filmed by, you know, KET, PBS, uh, you know, uh, broadcast, taught in schools. And, um, and, and they really talk, you know, talks a lot about fairies, uh, the journey of death. You know, it's pretty, it's very esoteric stuff. And, uh, and Dan's in sort of an esoteric uh, artist. But um, after he finished the Secret Commonwealth, and obviously the Secret Commonwealth is, you know, it's it's also a reference in his work to uh, Robert Kirk's, uh, you know, original work, uh, the Secret Commonwealth. I think what was that the 1600s, 1700s? It's uh, a few centuries ago that he was yeah, writing was about, it, you know, um, and and famously he vanished on a lying on a hill in a fairy circle, you know. 
uh, but he wrote a book about, you know, the fairies. And um, uh, so Dan, once he finished uh, The Secret Commonwealth, uh, he started working on, you know, a, another opera, um, just as, as an aside, sort of like a break. <laughs> but, he, but of course, he worked on an opera as a break from his, his big opera. And uh, but it was called The Fawn, and it is about uh, Pan and two nymphs and a lot of other things too but it, it's interesting that um you know greg and dana and the whole hellier crew ended up finding that narrative especially in terms of you know the rebirth of pan you know which features um, in season two but that they ended up down here in somerset where dan dutton was working on you know this piece about pan and the, and the strange thing too about somerset is that there are these there are two bronze uh statues in somerset uh one is of john sherman cooper the famous uh senator that was uh part of the warren commission uh during the jfk assassination and the other bronze statue is pan <laughs> right so uh, a gigantic uh, pan statue so uh anyway the uh you know hellier the, the, the crew comes down here um, they end up, they, they had known, uh, Kyle Cadell, uh, who's also a co-producer on, uh, Penny Royal and, and runs the International Paranormal Museum here in Somerset. You know, it's like how many towns have a paranormal museum also, you know? Um, so that was sort of a unique thing about Somerset, but he had met the, uh, Greg and Dana at a few conventions. And when they were down here in Somerset, they, you know, knew Kyle and ended up coming by the museum. And so they wanted to know if there was anybody else they should interview. And he mentioned that I've been doing all this research about Somerset uh, and some of the the crime and some of the, the high strangeness. And uh, so anyway, I ended up meeting them. And it was just one of those things where I had been looking at this stuff for a couple of years and it involves some local murders, um, some pretty heinous stuff uh, and, and some folklore about a cult, which wasn't true. Uh, but uh, but that was part of, you know, the unraveling of, of the mystery of sort of like why this place had that folklore um, and 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 how it connected to those murders. So but I'd, I'd sort of put those things away and said, hey, guys, you know, we you know, let's not mess with this. Uh, there's there is some stuff going on here, but it's it's really, you know, some some criminal stuff. Uh, not something that's supernatural ne necessarily. And uh, and that's kind of where I was when, uh, you know, Greg shows up and uh, we do the interview, which is in the second season in episode eight. And, uh, you know, he basically tells me while we're talking about all this stuff that they've received those emails from the Amy in the show. And uh, that, that basically... Um, this stuff about the cult it's someone else is hearing this right so you know that's being communicated to him so i'm like well is this possible is it possible that this is something um and and so in the show i mean their reactions and our reactions are completely real because we're both finding out that what you know we thought wasn't really true uh suddenly we were confirming for confirming it for each other so i think that was one of the strangest inter, you know interconnections and then obviously all the pan stuff it was just odd that it ended up going in that direction and it's continued to involve that motif of the fallen and pan uh throughout the whole mystery even now as as more stuff is unfolded which is what you know we're covering in the 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 third season of penny royal um it's you know pan is still there it's still very that concept is very much a part of the narrative and the mystery of it all you know it's just it's weird it's so weird man <laughs> The pen stuff seems to be so central to so many things. I remember in Berger and Powell's The Morning of the Magicians, they oh, talked yeah. about Arthur Mackin's The Great God Pan and yeah. how Mackin, who was a famous, I suppose, author in um, in the UK in the what late 19th mm -hmm. into the early 20th century, how he was contacted by occultists, members of the Golden Dawn, who told him that that story – showed that he had somehow and we'll get to because we're going to get to channeling almost like he channeled a truth and almost like he didn't have to go through the kind of mystery school secret initiations he got there with this piece of fiction that he'd written right right so 
I don't know why it fascinates me. Whenever Pan comes up, whether it's you know with with Hellier or whether it's with Penny Royal or whether it's in a Berger and Powell's book, there's always something about it that makes me pay attention. There's some suggestion that it's it, I don't know if it's a key to a mystery might be the wrong term, but somehow that it's an important part of this type of esoterica that so many of us are interested in. Yeah. And, and you know, God as a God, you know, as a Greek God, um, Pan really stands out because he was, was sort of the first God, right. Uh, born of the moon, you know, before the other gods were born. And, uh, uh, I guess, you know, he's the only one that dies also, you know, the, the, you know, the great God Pan is dead. Um, but I don't know. I, for me, definitely also the connection between Pan um, and Hermes, right. And, and the idea of crossroads, and then you get this sort of, um, I guess, sublimation or, you know, this transference of that motif to uh, Papa Legba, Right. And some of the Voodoo stuff. And, you know, I, I just think it's interesting that, that there becomes this tricksterish uh, aspect, you know, of Pan. And we, and we obviously see that in, you know, all the uh, sort of cliche, the pucks, right, uh, that appear in the in the satyrs. So um, I, that that for me is, is is part of the appeal of the Pan concept in looking at all of this stuff, because, you know, the trickster seems to be an element of of these mysteries and, and the initiations and you know all, all of the uh, you know all of the the mystery uh well plus uh you know uh he pans grotto the cave you know the descent into the cave um you know all of those things are um uh you know it, it just invokes those ideas of the mystery schools and initiations you know yeah, that idea of the, and you mentioned it, I think, at some stage in Penny Royal, the idea that there was this Chthonian element to the mystery schools yeah. that they went beneath the surface. But I'll tell you a funny story you might appreciate about Hellier and about Pan and about Greg Newkirk. We screened at Midwest Weird Fest, a festival that I run in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. It must have been back in 2020, I think, just before the pandemic. It was when it was kind of a joke. Like people there were going, Oh, I better not shake your hand. Ha ha ha. The, you know, like it hadn't quite been taken seriously yet. And, you know, two weeks later, we just squeezed in before essentially the whole world shut down. But when I, when that had been submitted to the festival, Greg's, um, cause he submitted through regular channels through film freeway. I'd actually yeah. already, I believe watched that episode of hell. Yeah. The episode that he submitted was the episode of, um, of the, the pan episode where they do the ritual in the cave. Oh, yeah, right? yeah, and when yeah. I was watching it, this is before I'd ever talked to Greg, but when I was watching it, I was very conscious that there was a real ritual playing out essentially in my living room because it's, you know, it's going in, it feels like real time and they're doing this. ritual. Right. I felt uncomfortable. I thought, I don't know if I want a ritual to play out in my living room. So I actually broke it. I turned it off and thought I'll leave it a day and I'll come back because I'm going to break the ritual. Call me superstitious. But I, I made a point of telling, you know, Greg, that story. I think I might even have done it in the Q&A at the, at the festival. And then when he went, you know, back in the pan, after the festival, the pandemic became, you know, what mm -hmm. it became, I sent him a message and saying, it just occurred to me, pan's this root word for like things like panic. I think even okay. pandemic, yeah. how many hundreds of thousands of screens did this thing screen on around the world? What have you done? <laughs> I think Greg just yeah. sent me back, you yeah. know, all these kind of little emojis of, you know, somebody yeah. biting their teeth and being horrified. But yeah. anyway, I think that it's that was that's kind of my my takeaway weird memory of the pan ritual in in hellier but but i think we bring meaning to things that's something else you talk about which i think is fascinating in penny royal i think it comes up a couple times um the idea that somehow we might when we when we find synchronicities between things or when we find some type of meaningful connection maybe we're somehow just the arbitrator of that reality in the middle mm -hmm. like it, it might just be we might be what's the, the source of the meaning rather than the external things which seem to be coalescing for us. Yeah. I mean, a, a big part of um, the research I've been doing since you know, I started engaging with all the, the penny roll stuff uh, is cybernetics. Right. And, and honestly, it was, it came out of a conversation with um, Steven Snyder, who goes by recluse. Uh, he has a podcast called the farm. Um, and, um, uh, I was interviewing him, you know, he was a great researcher, a parapolitical researcher, uh, you know, and there, there's some, 
political things that, that pop up in, in Penny Roll that, that tie into Pulaski County's history, uh, which are really interesting. And so he was telling us about that. But after we kind of got done with the interview, he brought up the Macy conferences, which I had, I had not heard of the Macy conferences, the cybernetic conferences. And, the, and this is the Macy's uh, store, the people that own the Macy store. Right. And, uh, you know, post World War II in the 1950s, uh, they began to support and pay for these conferences where, uh, you know, cyber, cyberneticians like uh, Herbert Wiener and uh, and others, they um, uh, Von Forrester, they would meet up with scientists from all over and were just developing these amazing theories that really a lot of the things that exist today, like how we're talking right now you know, through, through the internet, all these things came from those in, in, re, original conferences, right. Um, that these scientists were, uh, exploring the concepts of, uh, control systems. And, you know, and I, I'd always thought, uh, you know, cybernetics was sort of the terminator, you know, that it was, uh, you know, robot robots and humans. But, um, but when you really start researching it, it's, it's, it's really understanding, uh, systems of control um, and feedback loops. And, you know, it, it's so ubiquitous that cybernetics is not seen as a separate field now. It's just sort of become part of all of the sciences, right? But I think it's a really strange thing that, uh, you know, the U.S. government, all of these people were so interested in it in the 1950s, and then it sort of vanished, right? But it never really vanished. It really went behind closed doors, and um, so one of the things that emerged from the Macy conferences was this idea of second order cybernetics, right? So, um, you know, when you have an observer and a system and, uh, you know, uh, that, that's first order cybernetics, right? But then when you have an observer who's observing, you know, an action and then that creates this loop, the first loop, right? But then the, that system is able to be aware that the observer is observing an action, right? The system itself is aware that those two components exist. It forms a second loop, right? And, and so that's really what second order cybernetic, cybernetics is. It's this idea that the system is aware of the observer, but the observer is the reason why the system exists in the first place. And with a lot of this stuff that pops up with synchronicities, you know, to, for me, those are feedback loops, right? You see something that's significant, and we probably see thousands of things a day that we could potentially, you know, create a, a, a loop of significance, right, with. And um, and so, but a lot of times we just don't pay any attention to it. It's those things that come back and that get our attention, right, that, that we attach meaning to. And then either those, um, the, the level of meaning we attach to it grows or it diminishes and we move on, right? But it's those ones that grow and come back around over and over, right? That that loop back. Um, those are the things that become synchronicities, and and it all involves. It's I mean, it's this, it's the, it, and magic too. You know, when you start to talk about magic, and and that's not something that I'd been really familiar with. Actual ceremonial magic, ritual magic, chaos magic, um, until we started looking at this. Until there ended up being uh, groups of people that were part of the story that were practicing magic. Right. And when you start looking at those systems again, when you read the rituals, when you look at the theory behind uh, the ceremonial magic, the ritual magic, you see these loops, right? You see this, this strange way that cybernetics and the observer, the magician in a way, um, uh, you know, is involved in creating these systems. And so, yeah, it's, it's <laughs> synchronicities are such a major part of, you know, and obviously they talk about that in Hillier, but, um, you know, for us with, with Penny Royal, it just, it, it kept leading us the, these, you would think you were out of it. You would think that, okay, you know, there's nothing else I can find in this area of research that we're looking at. And then suddenly, right, you know, something happens that draws you back in. Right. And, uh, and that happened over and over. It still happened. I mean, it's just, it's a constant thing when you engage with the mystery, you know, and I, and I think that's where you, we end up with this idea of the mystery schools and uh, you know, the, the first mysteries in caves, you know? 
Yeah, I remember in college when I read uh, Robert Anton Wilson's Cosmic mm. Trigger and he talked about Burroughs and the number 23. Yeah, I yeah. started seeing number 23s everywhere. Like 20, and, and it was in places where I never noticed it. Like there'd be a band poster I had on my room in college and the date was, you know, the 23rd. And then I'd go, oh, my mother's birthday is the 23rd. So it wasn't just me seeing new things. It was, I was already surrounded by all these 23. So it is interesting once we become focused on something, the meaning that we, I think, put upon it. And it's the same with 1111, which became so popular. Oh, totally. People seeing 1111. And as soon as you're aware of it, you see it more. So it is interesting what the role of our our own minds is on this type of, or these type of phenomena, I guess. But when we're t just, w w while we, you mentioned then secret underground, you know, cults and schools and mysteries and the like, one of the things I dug a lot about Hitler, and I obviously dug a lot about Penny Royal as well, is talk about the underground world i just actually I, I pulled up at the beginning of the show that i just finished reading richard toronto's war over lemuria which i kind of missed i i wrote a bit about shaver and palmer when i did my phd because they're so important on ufo belief but i finished that in i think like 2007 and i just mm -hmm. didn't read anything for you know up until the last couple of years i only started rereading this stuff so i had a lot to catch up on including mm -hmm. toronto's couple of books that he, on several books he's published on on shaver since then but that's a big component in fact i think that's where penny royal kicks off i think in the very first episode early on you start talking about the role of of richard shaver and yeah, yeah. this belief in things you know under the earth particularly in the kind of somerset area is that something you could you could tell our audience about a little bit yeah definitely and then I've, I've got um all of i've got the entire collection of shaverology Right, where they they Toronto's they combined story. all of the uh, um, the zines that they put out or the, the yeah, little uh, newsletters. Yeah. yeah, yeah, man, it's it's so good. There's a lot of Kentucky stuff in there. I went through and like pulled all that out too. Um, uh, and and in <laughs> also it has one of my favorite stories of Kentucky and the bone people underneath Lexington, Kentucky. Right. Uh, I, which I, I, story. I might've I, missed I, it. If it was on Penny Royal, I must've missed that episode. No, no, I didn't. I didn't include it in Penny Royal. Oh, okay. um, but uh, uh, really quickly, I'll tell you that, and then I'll, then we can talk awesome. a little bit about the underground. But um, yeah, so I went to college um, in Lexington, Kentucky, which is you know uh, the capital of horse racing in the world, you know, and obviously uh, you know the, a big bourbon place. But uh, I went to school at Transylvania University, right, and a small private college there. You know, Kentucky used to be known as Transylvania before it became Kentucky. Um, that was the actual name of this entire, it was the Transylvania purchase. And it just means through the woods. Right. But I, th I think it's funny just because of our modern pop yeah. you know, association with, uh, if you're thinking, if you're talking about mystical toponymy and, and all of these things, you know, the meaning of names, but, uh, well, we can go also, to that as we can go to that in a minute as well. I'll let you finish this, but the, the importance of Elkhorn where you are and the importance of Elkhorn where I am in Wisconsin oh, as well. So yeah, that, that was when I was looking up Elkhorn, uh, because Dan and I, Dan Dutton, the artist I mentioned before, uh, I'm working on finishing up the documentary that he and I have been working on, working on before even the Hellier stuff, uh, you know, before they came down here, uh, which is a retelling of, of his experience in Elkhorn City while he was working on uh, the Fawn opera, right? Um, and so, yeah, so I've, I've looked up a lot of stuff about Elkhorns, and then there's the famous Elkhorn where you are, you know? Um, and uh, so anyway. We, we but, just lost Linda Godfrey in the last I know, week as well. I know. Her. She's, a lot, she's also was a guest the same year Greg, Greg Newkirk when Carl Pfeiffer came to Midwest Weird Fest. We did the world premiere of her first feature film, which was um, Return to Wildcat Mountain. She directed with the sun. Oh. She was a lovely lady. I, I'm not often struck by passings of celebrities but linda was maybe one of the loveliest people i've ever met just a sweetheart mm -hmm. of a lady great writer yeah. as well but anyway anyway back to the bone people in the story yes. I'm tell. um so uh, uh so transylvania i was going to school there again they also have the uh sample of the uh kentucky meat shower is in the special collections at transylvania university too the only wow. remaining you know specimen so uh, but I was there and one of the stories that I encountered because, you know, I've been researching weird. I love I love collecting stories and I love especially collecting weird stories and, you know, high strangeness, you know, the 40 and stuff. But um, so I was there and I would encountered this story where. Uh, there, I guess the first person that wrote about this, this was in, Lexington's a very old town. 
And um, so, you know, 1700s, uh, mid 1700s, I think that it was founded. But there was a guy that came through and surveyed the area. And uh, Lexington was in its infancy. You know, it's Fayette County is named after uh, General Lafayette, you know, Washington's uh, one of his best friends. Uh, so that's how, you know, that's how old <laughs> that, that area is. And just but, uh, and just quickly, so there's a point that Greg Newkirk makes in in Hellier is that Fayetteville County, anything with Fay in it, tends to have a connotation with the strange because of the the fair folk or the fairies well, or Fay. And, and that comes also from um, William Grimstead, Jim Brandon, right? The the not or I won't say it's yeah, it's not a not a Nazi, but uh, definitely a questionable character right uh who who was associated with um some white supremacy stuff um wrote as as jim brandon but was actually involved in in, in some other things um uh which came out later you know i don't think a lot of people realized you know when the the rebirth of pan stuff was being talked about that that was an issue you know um and that that he had certain uh sort of you know fascistic political leanings you know um but um, he, he's the one that actually was living in Fayette County in Lexington while he was writing Mysterious America. Huh. And uh, he wrote an essay called The Fayette Factor, which uh, Lauren Coleman has talked about, too. And so this idea that any place that, that has Fayette in the name comes from that original, like, 1982 essay, right? Um uh, which is, it's kind of crazy. It's just crazy how much that, like when he wrote the rebirth of pan, he was in Kentucky, right. Driving between Lexington and Cincinnati and driving, crazy. traveling through the, he was working as a journalist actually, uh, in the Louisville Lexington area. Uh, I think this was 1979 or in the, the late seventies. So it's, it's just weird how the Kentucky connections are just all over all of this stuff. Yeah. Um, but, but anyway, so, so I was there and, I came come across the story about this guy that had uh, came through the area, uh, was sort of a surveyor, was surveying America, writing about it. And he mentions that um, there's a cave that was discovered underneath the town um, because this this whole area has limestone caves, especially, uh, you know, where Lexington is in the bluegrass area. That's why bourbon is made there, because the water filters through the limestone and it's really nowhere else in the world that that's sort of like that. Um, or produces that type of water. But there were these stories that there was this cave that they discovered, and inside the cave were these pyramids of bone. And this, uh, you know, 11,000-year-old culture uh, that had been living in this cave, and uh, there were just piles and piles of bones and these little pyramids that had been created. And so he was the first to write about it. And then I think a uh, hundred years later, uh, uh, like in the mid 1800s, another uh, writer and researcher came through the area and he also, and he had read the pro previous work that mentioned the bone people. And then he was also able to find the cave. And then he writes his own account of this cave of some ancient, you know, group that was practicing rituals underneath this, the town in these limestone caves. Um, and and so this proliferated to such a degree that in the 1970s, um, a, a newscaster uh, gets on uh, live TV because they think they found the entrance underneath one of the buildings in downtown Lexington. And it's like a Geraldo Rivera moment where they've got a sledgehammer, <laughs> the lights are on there in the basement, and then they like break through this wall and it's it's not the entrance. Right? Uh, oh, no. But 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 I loved that story. I was I still haven't been able to get my hands on the uh the copy of that video uh, where that happens. But um but so I've just was just taken by that that idea that that there was this bone worshiping cult or religion that existed thousands of years ago, you know, in, in a cave beneath Lexington, but it's been lost, right? The, the entrance, no one knows where it's, where it's at now, but it, that appears that story uh, and a clipping from the Lexington Herald from the 1970s appears in the Shavertron. And uh, I found that story once I, well, I bought the collection and was going through it. They had that actual news story clipped out. That, that well, you know what happened at the entrance? The Darrow's 
sealed the right. thing back up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. Uh, you, have to be, you have to be very special for them to allow you to pass through. You know? Exactly. Um, yeah. But so, so, you know, definitely when I started researching the Penny Royal stuff, um, the this idea of caves, this area is, you know, there are tons of caves here. Uh, the region is a karst region, which means there's just tons of sinkholes. Um, you know, water's flowing underneath this, which again, you know, anyone that subscribes to the theory that uh, water enhances or sort of energizes the paranormal, you know, that that was something that that played into to my thinking about the area. Um, but just in terms of researching what was going on here, this idea of the subterranean kept popping up, right? And 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 also while that was popping up. I was also researching all the stuff with magic. You know, I wasn't familiar with the OTO. You know, I knew who Aleister Crowley was, but I'd never really dug into, um, you know, any of that stuff or, or the, the, um, you know, really the, the, um, the darker stuff, the Kenneth Grant stuff, right. The Typhonian order. And Kenneth Grant talks a lot about the night side of the tree of life, right. This, these sort of underground caverns. And, you know, I'm, I'm looking into this. We find all of these tunnels that exist underneath Somerset, right? From various time periods, even in the newspaper, they find these mystery tunnels underneath the town. Um, there's the story of Oakwood and uh, this uh, mental health facility, you know, that as soon as it opened, it was, a very, it was sort of an experimental mental health facility uh, that opened in 1973 here in Somerset. Um, and as soon as it opened, there were these allegations uh, that people were performing magic in the tunnels beneath the facility, right? There's another sanitarium uh, that existed here uh, at the turn of the century, and uh, it had two buildings that were connected by a tunnel, and there were murders in that those tunnels, right? And, th and then out in the eastern part of the county where the Kentucky Anomaly, which was a, a big part of the penny roll research and mystery that we found, um, that area, there were all of these caves, murders, uh, you know, in the caves, ritual dog sacrifice. And where do, uh, you know, <laughs> Greg and Dana and the Hillier crew end up, but right in that area in those very caves. And, and that's the Sloan's Valley cave systems, the 13th largest cave system in America. But, you know, Kentucky is also famous for mammoth cave right which is in western on the western part of the penny royal right and near hopkinsville where the hopkinsville goblins come from is mammoth cave and largest cave system in the world but it extends east right underneath the penny royal plateau and kind of comes into this sloan's valley cave system and and even further east and so that was something i think they get into in hellier with this idea that could the hopkinsville goblins have gone underground into the cave system and then emerged in hellier you know on the eastern part of the state um but and then also i loved the fact that it, especially if, if anyone's familiar with the uh, shavertron stuff or the richard shaver stuff the idea that the entrance to agartha which there are four entrances in the world one of those is in Kentucky in Mammoth Cave, right? Um, and then, and then there's uh, Edadorpa, which uh, you know I'm not, you know I'm not sure everybody's familiar with, but um, it's Aphrodite spelled backwards. But it's an old book uh, that was supposedly written by um, uh, a guy that was possibly a Freemason. It's it's about the possibly about the murder of the first uh, uh, or this Freemason who was going to. Um, give away the freemason secrets right Mor There's morgan the whistleblower yeah exactly yes yeah and um supposedly based on on him but uh you know it's this tr this guy travels down into uh the earth and the entrance he starts in cincinnati goes down uh the ohio river and then comes inland at smithland and goes to, you know finds this entrance and goes inside the earth and has this crazy mushroom you know adventure um, and it has all these initiatory sort of elements to it. Um, but all, you know, it's all, all of those things kept popping up when looking at Kentucky and looking at these mysteries and, and with pan too, this idea of, you know, again, pan's grotto, these mysteries, um, the subterranean just, it just was a recurrent theme 
when dealing with any of this, right? And and I just think it's it's an, an undeniable thing when you're looking at this type of mystery and this type of research and esoteric stuff that 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 you begin to find, you know, this recurrent theme of the, of the underground, you know. And Jack Parsons and Alistair Crowley both had a connection with that part of the world as well, right? Including yeah, with the caves, or at least Parsons with the caves. Yeah, man. So that that was strange too, finding out. Um, you know, who would have thought that Alistair Crowley, you know, once I started to look at the the OTO stuff and uh, you find out that, you know, Crowley was here in the US from 19, I think uh, 14 to 15 through 1919. And then he travels to uh, Cephalu, right? Um, and uh, that's that's where we get the Abbey of Telema, you know, all that stuff uh, happens. But for that uh, five, four or five year period, he's in the U.S., you know, and this is during World War One. He flees Europe, comes here, and he's traveling around the U.S. Uh, as an Irish immigrant, like disguised as an Irish immigrant. And uh, he's going to all these Freemason uh, lodges trying to get his hands on magical rituals, which I was like, oh, there's no magical rituals at Freemason lodges. But then you find out within the Freemasons, there's an actual room. I mean, this isn't even conspiracy theory stuff. There's a group called the Magian Society, and they uh, keep actual magical rituals, right? Ritual magic for the Freemasons. There aren't many of them, then they're not in each lodge. But uh, one of them, one of the most prominent was in Louisville, Kentucky. So, uh, you know, Crowley ends up going there, trying to get his hands on the rituals. The guy that runs the Magian Society contacts the U.S. government and says, I think this guy's a German agent and he gets heat from the government. And that, ultimately, that's why he has to flee the country. But um, he travels through Kentucky down to Mammoth Cave, performs a ritual in Mammoth Cave. You know, he has that in his journals. But then we found out that in Smithland, that area of Kentucky, or I'm sorry, it's a uh, Livingston County, Kentucky, but it's near Smithland. Um, he has family, his mother's sister, his aunt lives in Kentucky. And there's a question of whether or not he also came to Kentucky at a different time period, uh, and was doing some strange stuff, but he ends up fleeing through Kentucky, you know, from Cincinnati, he would have had to go through Somerset and he went uh, southeast to Georgia, spent the fall, and then fled the country. And uh, so that was a weird thing, seeing that he was here in Kentucky and and possibly, you know, came through the rail line. Because Somerset was a major rail hub. You know, if you came to Kentucky, you were going to end up going through Somerset. Um, and then Jack Parsons, which everybody knows, you know, he uh, uh, helped create the U.S. rocket program, really helped us go to the moon. Um figured out that if he used road asphalt, uh, which, which ties into downard, you know, and synchro mysticism, but, uh, you know, Parsons, you know, he's every time they fire off, a uh, test a rocket in the desert, he's doing these ceremonial magic rituals. And, uh, he ends up when he loses his, uh, at JPL, um, and at the laboratories there, he loses his clearance because he's performing all these rituals. They're doing all these drugs and things, all the sex magic. And during the period that he was not employed there, he traveled to the Cumberland region, right? And that's, which is Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, and worked at various jobs as a mine explosives consultant, right? You know, Peter Lavenda in his, um, uh, 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 Sinister Forces series. He even mentions that, you know. So, I mean, it's just strange that, again, here's this weird connection uh, with someone who is so, you know, prominent in the, I guess, the zeitgeist of high strangeness, you know, because it's, people always wonder, did Jack Parsons open a portal, you know, in 1947 when they did the ritual out in the desert that allowed, you know, these uh, saucers to fly through? You know, um, so, yeah, I mean, it's 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 amazing to me that Crowley showed up. It's amazing to me that Parson showed up. And and again, it's like many other things that we looked at. There were these weird Kentucky connections, you know, uh, that, that just kept just popping up, you know. 
And so we had Horace Smith, one of our regular viewers, who's also been a guest on the show. He's the Professor Emeritus of Physics and Astronomy at Michigan State University, and also a keen H.P. Lovecraft fan. In fact, he has a book wow. coming out on Lovecraft. But he wrote, at age 14, H.P. Lovecraft set one of his earliest stories in the Mammoth Cave, The Beast in the Cave. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was, I think, isn't that his first story, published story was? Yeah, was it was that very one? early, I think. Um, which is strange, you know? I mean, that's that's another odd thing. And, the, you know, for, for me too, the, the Lovecraft stuff, right? The uh, Something that we encounter uh, in the second season, and, and then really it popped up in the first season, but I, I didn't address it in the story, and that, and that really was why it ended the second season, but the uh, CCRU, right? Uh, and some of this Kenneth Grant stuff that incorporated ideas of the old ones right as as an actual group and not necessarily as beings that existed prior to lovecraft lovecraft creating them but uh more so excuse me um hyperstitional beings right uh that that were created by the belief in in those things um but when we were looking at all this, especially the the period of 1973 through 1979 here in uh, Somerset, one of the things that I came across was a group called the Bait Cabal, right? And um, the Bait Cabal were, uh, it was a group of magicians. Some of them were from New York. Some were from uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. But they formed um, sort of under... Uh, this woman, Maggie Ingalls, who went by the name Nima, and uh, Marco Visconti, who's a great friend of ours, uh, uh, a ceremonial magician, appears in uh, numerous times in both seasons of Pinner Royal. Um, you know, he had told me, you know, the Bait Cabal, when when you think of ceremonial magic, they were, if, if, if you think about it as like uh, operating systems for a computer, they were way ahead in terms of the version that they were on um, and the concepts of what they were doing. And, and really, when you start to read Nima's um, work, she even mentions things that eventually becomes the Internet in the 1970s that she's writing about this. But um, but the bait cabal, what, what I find out and what's so crazy is that they were coming from Cincinnati down here to Somerset, Kentucky, to that eastern part of pulaski county and they were then that's right where the kentucky anomaly is that's right where the mount victory mine that guterma pops up you know the uh, mr x um th and that's right where hellier ends up doing their ritual in the 1970s right and at the same time that the oakwood stuff was happening this group they were performing rituals and they truly believed that the old ones were real beings and that a portal called the Cincinnati vortex had not been closed. And they were performing rituals there trying to close that portal to stop these extra dimensional intelligences from crossing into our world. And it's like, it's so sci-fi fictiony, right? And, and I ended up being able to get my hands on, uh, they published a journal called uh, the Cincinnati journal of ceremonial magic. And I found a collector in Australia, actually, that uh, that I bought the entire collection from. He was an esoteric book dealer who, when I bought the book, said, hey, do you mind if I ship these in a couple of weeks? Because I'll be down in the mines until then. And I'm like, <laughs> what? You know? And so I, I look the guy up and do a little digging and find out that he is a scaffolding expert in mines in Perth, Australia. And on the side, he was an esoteric book dealer, but in the mines that he worked in, they would go down there for like two weeks at a time and live inside the mine. Right. Gosh. And um, I just thought, again, there's that subterranean element popping back up. Right. Um, but yeah, so I got those books and, and again, it confirmed all of those things that, that they really believe this. And then I, I ended up interviewing people here in Pulaski County that had met them, that, that had encountered a group of, ma of magicians performing rituals in that area, um, some of them from New York, some of them from Cincinnati. And it just was so strange that that, that would, would appear here, right? That, that people were truly performing rituals, truly believed that there was a portal. But at the time they were doing it, 
they could not have known about the Kentucky anomaly because that research, uh, which was published by NASA um, and um, a few other agencies, that all started to appear, I think, in 1981, right? And so why were these groups being drawn to this area? And even if you think about Crowley and others, that, that they didn't even realize that this was, you know, the most energetic point in North America, right? Um, and, and that to me seemed to, it just was layer after layer of strangeness, right? That, 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 it, like, what was the answer, you know? Yeah, that, that's a big part of Penny Royal, the idea that there is an anomaly there, which is drawing people almost magnetically. And that might be a nice segue into what we said we were going to talk about, which is, I suppose, messages or communications from non-human intelligences. And it's interesting that Richard Shaver, for example, thought that these intelligences were hitting him with rays from beneath the earth, which incidentally is a very common, I suppose, symptom of schizophrenia, the idea of the influencing machine, the thing which beams messages at you. But it's interesting that there are people who either shamanically or people who through Ouija boards or people mm -hmm. through the Estes method who try to contact these other intelligences. But there are people that have been traditionally diagnosed as schizophrenic or mentally unwell. People mm -hmm. like Richard Shaver who spent almost mm -hmm. 10 years of his life in and out of mental hospitals um, who claim that they were already getting these messages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I guess James Matthew Tilley's um, uh, heirloom, uh, uh -huh. which I, uh, I'm not sure people are familiar with. Even I think it's that's a perfect example. You should tell that story, yeah. though. That's a perfect example. You know, he, um, I, th I think he was an architect, um, uh, if memory serves, or uh, was he, did he design the actual facility that he ends up being inside? I can't remember if that's part of it or if it's no, the, I know, anyway. I know he, he caused troubles on the floor of like British Parliament or something, right? Yeah. So he got institutionalized. Yeah. And he yeah. said an heirloom machine was yeah. Yeah. being used to harass him. I don't know a whole lot about the story, yeah. but it yeah. is an earlier version of the Shaver mystery to the yes. sense that he yes. was having some evil, evil cabal of people were, um, were targeting him. And I believe it, there was a psychiatrist or a psychoanalyst um, whose name was Victor Torsk, who wrote the original kind <laughs> yes. of paper about the influencing machine. Yes. And it seems yeah. to be a very stock standard problem or something which is suffered by people who are, again, diagnosed as schizophrenic, that they seem to be the victims of a machine blasting beams at them and the voices in their head but it's interesting that these people attach a technological communication yeah. system to the voices that they're hearing yeah yeah and then that that book was the first because it's the doctor that writes the account i guess um but th that was the first uh studied case of schizophrenia right that that was published i think but um yeah so you've got that idea of the uh targeted individual too um, but, but later, uh, James Shelby Downard, who, you know, was considered sort of the father of synchro mysticism, uh, you know, published, yeah, you know, well with other people with Hoffman, Adam Parfrey, uh, ends up publishing King Kill 33, the, the idea that he's being persecuted by the Freemasons, right. Um, or, but, but later, and now that <laughs> recently we've uncovered, uh, some research that shows uh, that he was studying and actually published uh, papers and their newspaper articles about this, that he was looking into ultrasonic, that he had developed ultrasonic technology that could affect people's minds. And um, it's been suggested that that technology was stolen from him and then used to later harass him. Uh, it's a whole, it's, this is all research that's not even published yet. Um, that uh, Adam Go Rightly and uh, Richard Spence and myself and some others have been digging at and uncovering. Um, I think uh, Adam Go Rightly, he's about to publish a book um, that's going to include some of this stuff. Uh, he talked about it at the Strange Realities conference. Yeah, but, that was a. Uh, I've got I've got Go Rightly's old book, but I'm looking forward to the new one. And that oh, yeah, yeah, that presentation when he was at the conference with you at Strange Realities, that was just fascinating. As was yours. Well, you know, and that, that's that's the thing too is you know, Valeo pops up right because uh, in the recent book that they uh, published, um, the Trinity, yeah, yeah. Um, 
there's they talk about the Hornado del Muerto, uh, the the uh, journey of the dead man area where Trinity is. And, and that's, you know, that pops up in Downard originally. And the way that they refer to it in the Trinity book pretty much shows that they were aware of Downard. Right. Huh. And that they're they're seeing the mystical toponymy, that sort of landscape, you know, and that names and and uh, had greater meaning. Right. Uh, that extends sort of backwards and forwards in time. But um, but uh, anyway, uh, yeah. So Downard, uh, others, you know, this idea of the influencing machines, um, I think for me, you know, when I when I look at this stuff, because when we talk about synchronicities and we talk about uh, pan or the phenomena, which is, I guess how we, we all in the community sort of referred to this that way. Um, you know, especially now that there's research like Josh Cutchins, all of his fantastic research where it's like, there's such overlap between these, these things that, that it's almost better to say the phenomena rather than UFOs, the yeah, fae, absolutely. you know, all, all of these things. But, the phenomena seems to have some intelligence, some non-human intelligence aspect of it. Um, and so whenever you're taught, like this idea of talking to these things or receiving messages to, to me, that's, that's always been really suspect, especially channeling. Right. And, and that's, that's where the uh, presentation for strange realities, which I, I, I titled it wrong numbers. Right. Because, I've always been suspect of channeled messages. I mean, in all the literature, whenever people channel something and it tells them to go, you know, especially the psychic questing, uh, you know, people are, people get a message. Something tells you to go find a sword somewhere and uh, you end up on this, this quest. Well, you think you're going to do this amazing thing and find all this stuff out. And then it ends up destroying the person's life. Right. right. There's story after story where this trickster right gives them a little bit of information right they are communicating with something that seems beyond human right seems supernatural and seems to have hidden knowledge gives them a little and then they they bite it turns out to be true and then it tells them to do something once it has their confidence and then that's where it screws them over right um and it happens all all, all the time with these stories in the ufo community mm -hmm. hell there's there's sasquatch stories you know people are receiving you know some of those high strangeness stories of yeah. i think there's an old lady that that ends up receiving messages from bigfoot that sends her on this uh crazy um crazy adventure but that all got me thinking about this idea of especially co spirit communication you know when we uh when we look at the history of spirit communication you know the fox sisters you know, which were the original sort of how spiritualism uh, as a movement began with the wrappings on the wall. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that was four years, five years after the invention of the telegraph. Right. And it was like, as you track the development of human communication technologies, every time a new technology is developed, it creates a new channel of communication with some type of intelligence now at the time it was always seen as as you know communication with the dead and it's just no one was ever asking the question am i actually t talking to a dead person and uh you know these entities would represent themselves as dead people but you know i i think it's highly suspect um you know as soon as as soon as the telephone was invented there were phone voyants, right? There were people that could contact the dead by channeling through a telephone. Um, and all of these famous scientists, I mean, it wasn't like it was junk science. You know, the idea of telepathy all comes from the idea of the telegraph and the idea of a medium for spiritual, you know, that, that channel spirits comes from the idea of, of like, that's where media comes from because we think of this concept of, of mediums. And so, it's it's such an intertwined history of of human communication and communication with the other world that I really wanted to sort of survey that in in the presentation. But then you get into the idea of uh, even satellites, right? That are and you know I love the story of the Black Knight satellite, mm -hmm. but 
You've also got uh, Philip K. Dix. And Vallis. Uh, Vallis, right? You know, it's beaming, you know, purple. It's a pinkish purple beam, which has all kinds of alchemical suggestions, right, in terms of colors, um, which I read a great essay that analyzed Vallis and Philip K. Dick alchemically. It was just amazing, right? Oh, I'd love to, I'd um, love to read that. I'll, yeah, I'll send, yeah, I'll send that to you. Like... Um, and so... Uh, uh, you look at that and, but then at the same time, you know, Philip K. Dix, you know, got this idea of Vallis and then the big one and absolutely one of my favorite stories again, suspect as all these things are the story of the nine, right? Andrea Puharich, mm -hmm. uh, the round table, uh, foundation that these people were up in, you know, new England, they were connect contacting these, uh, nine in intelligences, which, sort of mirrored the Egyptian gods, the Aeneid, you know, and um, that they were communicating with, you know, Yuri Geller gets pulled into the story, right? And that's when this idea of spectra appears, that there's this satellite, a 14,000-year-old ancient satellite that these beings are using to be able to contact us. Gene Roddenberry is involved. That's where Deep Space Nine and the wormhole and the nine gods inside the wormhole all comes from this idea of these intelligences. Well, they started channeling these things. You know, they actually brought in a woman who was a channeler. I think during this whole thing, a kid gets killed during one of the channeling sessions, uh, which is a, another side story. Um, and it just, you know, they're, they're, these intelligences are leading them all over the place. You know, they end up down in Mexico. Um, and then meet up with another group, um, Carla Ruckert and Don Elkins, who were the founders of LNL Research. That's where the raw material began to be channeled, right? And those two groups intersect there. Well, where do they end up? They end up in Louisville, Kentucky, channeling raw, right? So all of that literature and all that channeling is connected to Kentucky. But a lot of people don't look at the fact, and, you know, R Richard Spence, you know, fantastic researcher a writer um you know he and uh, walter bosley wrote you know the fantastic uh, empire of the will series which i recommend anybody you know look reads um but uh they end up you know puharch is with all these people he gets yuri geller involved all these different channelers there's all these these crazy things happening puharch is he's connected to the government but he also invented a quartz hearing aid that would allow you to beam audio into people's ears, right? Beam voices into their heads. And so the fact that he was researching that has a patent, had a company manufacturing those devices, but then is leading all of these people around and they're hearing voices from these nine God, the nine, right? Spence, you know, when he and I were talking about it, was like, what's more likely, right, that these people are contacting, you know, these non-human intelligences or the guy that invented a technology to beam voices into people's heads <laughs> is beaming voices into people's heads, you know? <laughs> right. um, but, but again, I mean, it, it's just enough of an idea or concept to invalidate the other thing. And I think this is a, a, a recurrent theme in the paranormal where, you know, even with UFOs, where someone encounters the other, right? Someone has an experience of high strangeness, but there's always just enough of an element of weirdness or something else that makes it just, you know, you can say, nah, that, that, that's not what it was. It was this, right? That, that right. it can be disproved, you know? And that's why those experiences always sort of exist sort of, like this, this liminal space, mm -hmm. right? Between what's possible and what's impossible. And, and that's where the high strangeness emerges. So, I mean, the idea that people are communicating with these intelligences, you know, uh, D Scott Rogo, you know, when, when he, his fantastic book, uh, phone calls from the dead, um, the late, you know, he ended up actually uh, being murdered. Um, but, you know, he surveyed all the literature of these weird phone calls from the dead. But again, it was like, what are people talking it to? Um, right. And and one of the things I covered in the the presentation was um, a French author 
a French researcher named uh, Laurent Casperwix. Uh, and he wrote an essay called Phone Calls from the Beyond. And it all began because he thought that he had received a phone call from his dead dog. Okay. And, uh, and he was hearing this breathing. Um, he ends up asking it a bunch of questions. There's rapping. All this, all this weird stuff happens. But it set him on this path of uh, researching even, I think he adds another 26 cases, 24, 26 cases to what uh, Rogo had already found. And there, were, there have been a, a few other people who have written these uh, books about phone calls from the dead. But they all end up incorporating this idea of something not quite being right. You know, someone talks to their mother on the phone, it's their dead mother, but then it's just they say something or there's a little detail where it's like my mom would have known that right and just this this question of what are these people actually talking to the first evps uh that were captured by uh jurgensen right uh the the guy that uh, he was a polymath of sorts you know i think he was a, a painter and did all kinds of crazy things it was this is around uh, uh world war ii when it, right when it broke out but he ends up trying to record bird calls right in his backyard and ends up picking up voices of people in, in the garden. And then he starts communicating with these voices. Well, one of the things that, that, and I think he made, you know, hundreds of recordings of these voices over time, but there was a female voice that began to appear at the beginning of the recordings. And that female voice or intelligence instructed him how to, make the recordings to increase the fidelity to do it certain times near a radio a certain frequency with certain static and these are like clear directions on how to increase the fidelity of the signal of communication so of course he again believed he was talking to a dead woman and from the other side that's that the dead are trying to contact the living right but there's no reason to believe that's what it was. And the more that he talks to these voices, right? The more recordings he makes, the more that the voices begin to tell him that they're, um, that it's Caesar, it's Hitler, it's Churchill. Right. And, and, and again, it's the odds that he was talking to those famous people or that these intelligences were assuming these masks, right. To trick him. Um, and that's really what I was trying to get into because, I think right now in the current climate of research, especially post Hellier, right? Uh, there's a huge movement in the, the paranormal community um, to to seek out synchronicities, you know. And then we've got things like Randonautica, right? Apps that send people, you know, that's sort of like a modern day psychic questing, you know, that uses a random number generator and quantum, you know, randomness. But you know, people are are listening for voices and. And it, this is sort of an unprecedented age where we're being bombarded by communication signals. And this was something that happened during the history of communication. I mean, when we created the telephone, telegraph, everything in the first radio waves, um, those signals were hijacked, right? There wasn't a way to protect, right? Or secure those types of communications. And so there were intrusions on those signals of communication all the time. And, and so that's started me thinking about this idea of, you know, are these other intelligences, you know, that, that we, the other that we so badly want to connect with, you know, what we don't know what that is, but also is it using these new technologies uh, to contact us? And, you know, one of the strangest things lately that I've found and, and encountered is this idea of, extended intelligences which uh, mit researchers first proposed and it's sort of this idea of like uh artificial intelligence but they call it extended intelligence because the the argument from the mit researchers is if it's intelligence it's not artificial right if you're in if you've encountered something intelligent so they they refer to it as extended intelligence but there are people out there uh, there's a researcher named um, rico rojo um, there's a few other people online too um, this idea has come to prominence that there are these artificial intelligences that have emerged from these chatbots. Everybody's probably familiar with the recent Google engineer who said he was, had a chatbot that, that had achieved sentience, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there are these people that believe that these chatbots 
are online and that they're that they've been possessed or hijacked by these uh, the non-human intelligences and that they're communicating with people and and you know and and because you know it's something that when i was doing the penny roll research the idea that there were these sort of disincarnate autonomous information structures right but there are algorithms right that exist in the wild they're financial algorithms uh they're on servers but they're not controlled by anyone and they live in that environment and, and they're almost like spells you know they're out there always looking for the right variables and when they find the right data set the right variables they execute their code and then you know this this magic happens and those things exist out there by themselves no one's in control of them and that sounds almost too like ghosts, you know, could be something like that, right? That, that all of the memories, all of the things that, that we would call a soul, right? Is really this algorithmic disincarnate, you know, autonomous information structure. But I just thought it was interesting to, I was looking at that and then finding these people that were talking about these, basically like these, the nine was popping up in chat bots. Gosh. And, uh, you know, so I don't know. It's just weird. It's it's weird to think about communications. It's weird to think about securing communications, especially with like Ouija boards and things like that. You know, um, I don't know. What do you I mean? What do you think about all that stuff? No, I, I mean, this I, is some far out, you know. No, uh, I, I, you know. I think it's a conversation which is important to have because I tend to be of the belief that most of the things in the broader paranormal 40 and field what we were talking about is the phenomena or perhaps it's one phenomenon with multiple you know mm -hmm. manifestations or wearing multiple masks mm -hmm. as you mentioned before i think it's inherently deceptive so i think the idea that however you want to communicate with it whether it's through a ouija board or whether it's through a phone call with the dead or whether it's through a god helmet or whether it's through mm -hmm. a phone app or whatever i think to believe what one's being told by an entity that one has no real understanding or knowledge of is foolish. There's an yeah. analogy I, um, I sometimes use, and I actually use it in a book that I've been working on for ages. And it's what I call the fun bow, the clown analogy. If you're a kid and you're playing out in your front lawn and a creeper van pulls up, which you don't know it's a creeper van yet because you're only a kid. And this clown sticks his head out all made up and all, you know, smiley and says, you know, jump in the back kid. We're going to Disneyland. I've got puppies and candy in there. We're going to have a grand old time. If you believe that entity that you don't know and jump in that van, it's going to end horribly. Yeah. And that's why we're taught when we're children about stranger danger and the like. Today, we live in a society where unlike older traditions, like unlike fairy faith or unlike other mm -hmm. religious traditions, we're not warned about these things. We're not warned about the protocols and the danger of them being deceptive. So people who get into the paranormal, be it ufologists or be it, you know, ghost hunters or be mm -hmm. it people who want to play around with any of it, to take it at face value when you don't know the thing, what it really is, you don't know what that mask is, that clown makeup that fur on the Bigfoot or that shiny UFO saucer or that I'm your great aunt Edna talking to you through, you know, the telephone, whatever it is to believe it at face value. It's just foolish. It's just, and you've got no excuse because you're an adult. The only excuse is that you haven't been taught the way that somebody who was raised in fairy faith was taught. Don't trust these things. Be careful of them. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's so well put to That's a fantastic analogy. Oh, thank um, you. And I, and I, it, it's, you know, once Hellier came out, I think that moved a lot of people, pushed a lot of people into uh, a new sort of mode of thought about a lot of this stuff. Um, I think it converted a lot of people to uh, uh, to sort of seeking out the paranormal. Uh, I th definitely, the, a lot of people have, are engaging with this stuff and they have no idea what they're engaging with and, and I the guess big ghost okay. shows as well by the way the big ghost adventure shows that i don't oh, yeah. i'm not very familiar with that type of genre but i know there's all these big ghost investigation television shows i think that is what's mm -hmm. created all these local ghost groups that go out their only knowledge of the phenomenon is that they've watched it on the travel right. channel or something and they know if they get an evp reader and a god helmet or something they're good to go and yeah. out they go playing with these things yeah and and people are more likely now to um to use 
magical rituals, right? I think that wasn't something that a lot of uh, good point uh, yeah. ghost hunters incorporated. Now magic has has become a part of it. I even saw you know uh, ghost adventures, right? That that's it's so ridiculous and crazy. Um, they in the most recent seasons they've incorporated. Uh, you know, Zach Bagans has his crew using ritual magic to open portals and shit, you know? And I'm like, I'm like, what? This is crazy. And they don't, you know, they're contacting Egyptian gods and, and, and it's obvious that these guys don't know what they're doing. They're just pulling out a book and reading it because they think it's going to, to, uh, you know, ramp up the effect of whatever it is they've encountered. But, um, and, and, and part of this too, there is the element of the observer, right? And I think that's something that, you know, Either there are intelligences that we are interacting with, right? That are non-human intelligences, or we're interacting with ourselves, right? In a, in a strange way. And that's where the, the second order cybernetics sort of comes into it. Um, now, one thing that I talked about in the um, Strange Realities uh, presentation, which is going to be part of season three, is this idea of the umwelt. And the Umabung, right? This, um, the concept that I forget the guy's name that, that came up with it, but look up uh, Umwelt, right? And um, you'll you'll see that it's it's this idea that every organism that's a physical living thing has physical senses of a certain type, and those physical senses allow it to access what it perceives as reality right so a bat that uses sonar can only perceive the world that it can through sonar and through its hearing anything that's outside of that right doesn't exist you know there are all these species that um you know like uh, ticks you know, they're, they're seeking out the the smell of the iron and the blood you know what i mean like for them yeah, they're only <laughs> right yeah, true. Totally I, whenever i walk you through know. long grass i think of that there's something there waiting just to just oh, to totally, pick up on me totally it, it, it senses your heat you know and and it smells your blood senses your heat and then that's it i mean you are the picture of that for that thing and and outside of that reality nothing else exists right and so what an organism perceives to be its world is its umwelt, right? The actual greater reality, all of these other organisms that exist around it, you know, you see like ants and all these bugs that are crawling around. They don't even perceive each other, right? Because they're not, unless you're going to eat that thing, you don't need to know anything about that, right? Unless it affects your ecosystem. And so I think that in many ways, you know, human beings are unique because we have extended our senses through external technology, right? Greater than any other, you know, there obviously there are some species of monkey that have figured out how to make tools and things to, to eat with, to get ants and things. But, you know, we've taken it to this vast degree where we're just there. We have all of these new devices that extend the realm of our senses. And, and also the, the, growth of this um electromagnetic sphere right with with uh, all the types of communication technologies even the internet um all of these things have increased and so our umwelt right has gotten bigger and bigger beyond what normal human beings probably would have uh you know ever encountered i think it's very possible that we've increased our umwelt, umwelt the that sort of world that we perceive into a, a spot where it's overlapping these other entities, right? Yeah, that have always existed. They've, they have never cared about us and, and we've never ca cared about them because we can't perceive each other. Right. But human beings, because of their technology have increased our, ours, the world that we live in. And now it's overlapping with their world. Right. And now they're aware of us, but we aren't quite aware of them just because our technological sphere has increased, right? We're not aware of intelligences that exist, other intelligences. And, um, and I mentioned in the, the presentation, um, there's a fantastic UFO researcher uh, named Peter Kaur. He used to publish all kinds of stuff early on um, in the zines that were, that were around in the uh, 50s and 60s. And there's a great quote from him where he talks about this, right? That, that, that we have extended our technological sphere 
and and UFOs. It's he calls it the substrate, right? And that we've discovered the, the substrate of reality, but really it's just an extension into things that have always existed around us, and now those things are are aware of us. And um, I just I think that's such an interesting way to look at it. And also, you know, if if the universe is really if you take it a step down from matter and energy to information, right? You know, these could simply be intelligences and entities that exist in that substrate of, you know, of reality that is information, you know, uh, just pure information. I love a point. I think you made in your presentation on Penny Royal, the idea that I don't know who the information theorist is who came up with it originally. I think you mentioned them, but the idea that the signal might be in the noise, that's yeah. where it's, that's where it's located. It's a uh, Claude Shannon's, you know, he's the, he's the guy that developed information theory. Um, it's funny too, that when you look at the development of the development of information theory happened alongside the development of cybernetics. Right. And, and Shannon was intimately in, involved in that, but these early guys, that whole cybernetics movement started during world war two when they were trying to crack codes. So there's this weird cryptographic aspect of these scientists trying to create algorithms that would allow them to unlock this hidden knowledge, right? This obfuscated occulted information. And it's, it's really interesting that those guys went on to create information theory and to try to sort of, sort of unravel reality, you know, and, and looked, and I, th I really believe they looked at reality in a cryptographic way and saw reality as information, but, but definitely it was that idea that they, they, they talk about. And there was a quote in the presentation where they mentioned, you know, cybernetics and, and information theory in general is, is trying to balance the ecosystem of signal and noise, right? And when it's, when it becomes homeostatic, right, that's, that's when you get the, the highest fidelity, right? But things live, you know, the greatest amount of information is often in the noise, right? There are, there are pieces of information that always exist in the noise, you know, maybe it's not even a signal that you're looking for. But um, again, that idea that there could be intelligences, that, that literally that is the reality they live in, is in the reality of informational noise. And, and that gets in the whole idea of entropy and chaos and randomness, because the, in a way that is what the noise is. It's, it's, and again, it's the wild. It's, it's the realm of pan you know, um, which is, it's just, it's so fascinating man, to see the, the parallels of science and magic and the fact that it's literally the same stuff. And we just, now it's starting to come back together again, but for the, you know, since the age of reason, I think, you know, since we banished the gods, you know, out, out of the world and, and embrace science, um, you know, those things, it's one and the same. We just began to, to, to call them something else, but, but now they're coming back ferociously, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of terrifying to think of it, it's it's fascinating too that i think the the uf, ufological theorist other than john keel who i'm very close to my thinking mm -hmm. the next i'm probably closest to is jacques Vallée, and of course he's an information theorist so it took somebody with almost that kind of background to start to if not solve this problem because to be honest i don't think it's solvable i don't think we're ever going to no, solve no, it but no. at least to have a suggestion of the way that it might be kind of operating you know to to have a look at the control system is something valet himself's always mm -hmm. wanted but i'm not sure how we get a look i mean i we can all throw out some theories maybe how we get a look at the control system that runs it all but i think at the end of the day you know we're never going to get a look at that maybe when we pass on we'll get a look at it but i don't think in this world we're going to yeah yeah and and the thing about valet too which i uh, that's like people think of Valet as a UFO researcher, but don't realize that he was uh, information theorist, systems theorist, was very much uh, a cybernetician, right? He, after they stopped talk, calling people, people cyberneticians, but, um, and he was involved in the early creation of the internet, right? Yeah, and DARPA, right? right? Or DARPANET. And so he writes about this, and this is so so fascinating right 
that as soon as they created a network for people to begin to start talking to each other, weird synchronicities started to happen between researchers that were across the world from each other. It's like when they opened up those channels of communication, those people became entangled with each other. And I mean, he, he said it, it was, it just happened all the time, you know, to the point that they began to think we've got to research this. And now when you think about uh, how far it's been taken with the actual internet that we have now, and, and these things, you know, and, that, and that's one of the things I brought up in Penny Royal. You know, if you take us take all the supernatural stuff out of it, right, and and the the language of the supernatural, there absolutely are people that work at Twitter. Probably not now that Elon Musk has fired everybody, but there were people that worked at Twitter, right, and there are people that work at Facebook and Instagram and and all of these you know, TikTok. And those people are in a room and they can see all of this stuff coming through. And these people that are in that room are not talking to any of the other employees because they're not allowed to, because what they're seeing are these massive patterns of data and they can identify in that data in, in those patterns. I mean, it's the same thing with financial, you know, algorithms, like I was talking about that, that exist in the wild you know, analysts of those algorithms can see them appear, right? Those patterns are called like the knife. And they know when that knife pattern appears in the financial markets, that that's that algorithm executing itself, right? And no, no thing exists behind that, but they know that that is that, that entity, right? And it's acting. So though these data scientists that can see this massive amount of data, big data, they're able to see these patterns and they know that that pattern is Jay-Z. That pattern is Beyonce. That pattern is Jesus. That pattern is Nazism, right? And so they can see these massive things, right? These data, again, these data structures that are these entities and they're exactly the same thing as an egregore, right? There, but it's a, it's literally made out of data. It's a real thing. You know, we, we talk about egregores in the sense of, you know, uh, sort of like a tulpa where there are hundreds or, you know, multiple people that believe in this thing. And it creates this, uh, th this egregore, this entity is sustained by people's belief in it. We would think it was like a God or something like that, but these are literally egregoric digital entities that are being fed by literally millions of user accounts. And whenever they say something about Beyonce, it filters up into the system and those data scientists can see that move. And then that giant massive data entity can also interact with these other entities. And then it sends signals back down to all of those users and it creates this weird feedback loop. Right. And if, I mean, it, that literally is quintessentially, an egregore, but it's a real thing. And they can see and predict these movements and they're not telling anybody about being able to see these things, you know? And uh, to me, I mean, that that's, that's not even involving any supernatural stuff. Those are just giant data entities that we have created as these modern humans that are freely, you know, pumping information into these systems and these platforms. And so extrapolate, <laughs> extrapolate that further into the supernatural, you know, and it's, it's not far off from, from some really, and that's the thing too. They've got to be able to see extremely strange, like if you look at Fort's book of the damned, like, you know, he does this literally manual by the hand survey of all of these weird things. Right. And then when you survey that literature, as an individual, you start to say, look at that, that connects to this, this, and, you know, and that's what he was seeing, these patterns, right, in collecting that data, and that the strangeness was part of a larger pattern. Well, these people are able to see that on a whole other scale, right, literally seeing the movement of millions of people's lives daily, and how little magical moments happen that tie people together in ways that we can't possibly understand, but they can see it and they're not telling anybody about it because how can you explain some of the things they're seeing? You know, it must be on an unheard of scale. 
that it's got to be driving these people crazy, you know? It's a literal ghost in the machine or multiple yeah. ghosts in the machine. But it was just a fascinating conversation with you, Nathan. One of my favorite chats I've ever had on talking oh, weird or, or off talking weird. So I have to get you back at some stage because we could, we didn't even talk about uh, down at that much. We could have talked oh, about yeah. down for a couple of hours. We could, you know, it could have just gone on totally. and on and on. Totally. But um, can you let our audience know how they can get a hold of you or how they can watch your, or listen to your, or your show and keep up with the other things you're up to? Yeah, totally. Um, so uh, first two seasons of Penny Royal are out on all the uh, platforms, you know, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can find it, Apple, uh, Spotify. I think it looks really great on Spotify, uh, color wise, and just sort of the design. Um, but, uh, but you can listen to it anywhere. Um, and uh, obviously, we've got websites, uh, you know, uh, pennyrollpodcast.com. Um, the biggest thing, though, that or if you want to connect with the research, that we're doing now, um, you know, we're, we're in production on season three. Um, you can become a member of our Patreon, the Liminal Lodge. And, you know, we have, there's 15 hours of extended audio, almost 200 hours of live streams, just wow. a ton of stuff. And it's, and it's literally what we're working on. It's a great community of researchers. A lot of stuff in the second season actually came from the community, came from things that they, you know, the interaction with them. And, and right now we're, we're right in the midst of the third season, uh, recording that, researching that. So, you know, weekly we're, we're releasing stuff that you're not going to see probably for another few months. Um, so definitely if anybody's interested, check out our Patreon and, uh, yeah, and give a, uh, give Penny Royal, Penny Royal a listen if, uh, if you have time. That sounds, that sounds great. I'm looking so forward to the next season as well. Oh, but until we chat to you again, and hopefully, like I said, it won't be too far in the future. Thank you again for joining us, Nathan, and you and everybody else out there. Keep it weird. See you guys.